Well, it's good to see everybody this evening, and hope you're all doing well. It's always a joy and a privilege to be with brethren on Sunday evening, and this is no exception. We're thankful that you come our way, and if you're visiting, we're honored to have you, and hope you profit by being with us in our study, and encourage you to come back and be with us whenever you can. There was a man one time that walked across a high wire that was stretched across Niagara Falls. And there were people on both sides watching as the man made his way across, pushing a wheelbarrow across Niagara Falls. And when he got to the other side successfully, there were cheers from the crowd because they were so glad that he'd been able to do that. Well, he said, how many of you think I can do it again? They all raised their hand. They thought, well, yeah, do it again. He said, who among you would get in my wheelbarrow? Nobody agreed to get in the wheelbarrow. I use that illustration to emphasize the point that we all have anxieties in life and that God has made some stupendous promises in his word. And when you think about those promises, the question that comes to my mind is, do we really and truly believe the promises of God? Are we truly ready to accept his way, our own way, rejected no longer are we ourselves but christ living in us as paul said in galatians 2 and verse 20. how many of us really and truly trust god enough to do what he says in all the circumstances of our lives and put away our anxieties and trust in god and to think about that i, I went to the psalms 52 and verse 22. now we talked about this last sunday night and how it is that when a person has these anxieties, Sunday night before last, I guess it was, how that a person like David, who wrote the psalm, was anxious because of the fact that there were those who were out to kill him, out to destroy him. Now, obviously, David was king, and we're not. He had adversaries that you and I do not have. But nonetheless, we do have enemies, we do have adversaries, we do have problems and trials in our lives, and we have the same situation in one sense that David did. And David made this statement after complaining to the Lord. Someone said one time that many of the Psalms start out with a sigh and end with a song. And David ended with a song. And here's what he said in Psalm 55, as you look at verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Now that's an amazing promise. That you can cast all your anxiety on the Lord. All of the things that you have that are troubling you. And the Lord will hear you. And he will not permit the righteous to be moved. Again, that's repeated in the book of 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Now, that's an amazing promise. We can cast all of our anxieties. Now, the King James, the new King James says, cast all your care upon him. And that's a little bit misleading because it's not talking about care in the sense of the fact that we're to care for one another. But it's talking about care in the sense of anxiety and the problems that we have, the turmoils that we go through that cause us to be anxious. We can cast them on the Lord, and the Lord will hear us. The Lord will sustain us. So that brings my mind to three questions I want to answer in our study tonight. Number one is how is it that we cast our care upon the Lord? Number two, what does that mean? And number three, how does the Lord sustain his people? So let's begin our study by noting how that God said, cast your care upon him. Now what does that mean? Well, first of all, we go to God in prayer. And this is taught in the book of God again. When you turn to Psalm chapter 62 and verse 2, is a beautiful verse that tells us that we are to cast our care, cast your burden on the Lord, and he'll sustain you. And in that verse, it says that we need to go to God in prayer. To you, all flesh will come. All people go to God in prayer, and they go when they're in trouble. Now that's not to suggest that's the only time we go to God. Because when you read your Bible, you'll find the faithful child of God will go to God anytime they're in trouble and anytime they're in prosperity. 
Oftentimes, people have the mistaken idea that when they're in trouble, they need to go to God, and when things are going well, they don't need to go to Him. The faithful child of God is one who goes to God at all times. But in times of trouble, he can go as well, and God will hear him. In the book of Philippi, <coughs> Philippians, I should say, chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, when Paul was in jail for preaching the gospel, he wrote one of the most encouraging letters that you'll ever read. Because he talks about joy and rejoicing all the way through. Although he's in dire straits, he's in jail for preaching the gospel, not for any wrongdoing, but for right doing, for doing what the will of the Father is, that he preached the gospel. And yet there were people out to do everything they could to oppose his preaching. He had his own brethren, he said in chapter 1, who were fighting against him. He had unbelievers, he had the Jews. Everybody was against Paul, it seemed. But Paul was joyous. Paul was full of joy and rejoicing in the Philippian letter. And he said in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, Be anxious for nothing. How many of us do that? You ever get anxious about things? Paul said, don't worry about anything. Well, how in the world can we do that? Well, he says, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. That's the key. We need to pray to God. We need to go to God and cast all of our care upon Him. And we need to do that in prayer. Because when we do so, we're following the will of the Lord. Now please note that he says, I want you not to be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Supplication is an intense type of prayer. It's the prayer that the child of God makes when he has an intense desire and is anxious about something. And he says, with thanksgiving, don't ever forget to be thankful. Don't ever forget that God has blessed us, even in our troubling times, even in times of adversity. We need to cast all our care upon God. We need to go to God in prayer. We need supplication, but we need not to forget to be thankful because we have that ability to go to God and God will hear our prayers. The second thing that we need to understand about casting our care upon God is lay your anxieties upon Him. Again, in 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care. And again, that's rendered anxiety in the New American Standard, which I believe is a better rendering. It gives a better understanding of what he's talking about. He's not talking about the care that we're to have for one another. He's talking about the anxiety that we have because of the troubles that we go through in life. We're to cast all of our anxiety before him and on him, for he cares for you. Now that's what we need to be doing. When you have a trouble in life, a problem, I don't know what they are. Yours may be different from mine, but you have them, I have them, everyone has them. I had a man to tell me one time, he said, you're a preacher, you don't have any trouble. I didn't know the man from Adam's off ox, as the expression goes. I looked him in the face, I said, sir, I wouldn't tell anybody they didn't have any trouble. I wouldn't tell anybody, I wouldn't tell any man, you don't have any problems in life. Everybody has problems. Even those we may not really know very well, but we think they're doing well, and they may appear that way, but they've got problems. Everyone has trouble. Everyone has things that cause us to be anxious and to cause us to be troubled in our minds. But he said, I want you to realize that you can cast that upon the Lord. Lay your anxieties to God. Now here is what he goes on to emphasize in that. Leave them before God. Now here's what a lot of people do. They have trouble. They have a real burdensome problem. They take it to God in prayer. And they say, God, I've got this problem. I've got this burden. I've got this heavy load. I want to cast it on you. And when they get through praying, what do they do? They pick it up and keep it. <laughs> That's not casting our care upon God. That's not casting our anxiety on God. When we cast our anxiety on God, we don't keep it. We leave it with Him. And the Bible in indicates in Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 25 and reading through verse 34, that we're not to worry about the things in this world, what we shall eat and what we shall drink and what we shall put on. He says in verse 26, look at the birds of the air. Did you ever look at the birds of the air? You know what amazes me? When I look up and I see these birds that are not flapping their wind, wings, but they're just floating through the air. And they're just gliding along and, and going by the air currents that are keeping them up in the air. 
And he said, look at those birds. The ones that are that way and the ones that are flapping their wings. You, you consider them. He goes on to say, they don't sow or reap or gather in the barns. They don't do those things we have to do in order to sustain our lives. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? If God takes care of those things that are animals, we're worth a lot more than they are. God knows what we need. Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to a statue? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how that they grow, they neither toil nor spin, and yet they still grow. And Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, he says in verse 30, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or with what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. That's what the people of the world look after, is what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink. And they're anxious about all those things. And they're giving their lives to the pursuit of material possessions rather than focusing on the spiritual. Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. And he says in verse 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Put the priority in your life, the kingdom of God, the will of God. And his righteousness, how I can be right with him, how I can be right with myself, how I can be right with my fellow man. These are the things I need to pursue first, not what I'm going to eat, what I'm going to drink, what I'm going to put on, and be anxious to the point that I am distracted away from serving God first. I need to put him number one. And he said, these things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. You know, tomorrow's not here. And the past, we can't worry about that because it's already gone. We can't do one thing to undo the past. We have the present. And he says, tomorrow we'll worry about its own things. You'll have enough trouble tomorrow. Don't, don't borrow tomorrow's problems today. You'll have trouble then you need to worry about or be concerned about. Not worry, but be concerned about. Take it to the God in prayer. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. One day's trouble is all that I need. And that's all you need as well. And so therefore, what we need to do is cast our anxiety on God, go to him in prayer, lay our anxieties before him, and walk away burden free. Now how in the world are we going to do that? How are we going to leave our anxiety with God? Well, let me suggest three things in that regard. Number one is exercise your confidence of faith. Show that you have some faith in the word of God. Lay your anxieties before him. Leave them before him. Exercise the, the fact that you have confidence of faith. You know, when you go back to Acts chapter 12, and the last point I made, leave your anxiety before God, exercise your confidence of faith. That's exactly what Peter did. Because in Acts 12, it says, about that time, Herod stretched forth his hand to harass some of the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And he intended to do the same, evidently, with Peter. And so he had Peter incarcerated, and he was next. Now, you put yourself in Peter's position, and what would you have done? You know that James has been killed by Herod. Herod is a ruthless killer. He, like the people who went before him and came afterwards, was one who was a ruthless, ungodly, immoral person who cared nothing about human life. And here Peter was put in jail with four squads of soldiers. Now, squad was four soldiers. If my math is correct, that was 16 soldiers. Four at a time was guarding him, day and night. And what was Peter doing during all that time? Was he wringing his hands? Was he worried? Was he anxious? No. The Bible says he was asleep. Now that amazes me. Here's a man who's in prison, who's being guarded with 16 soldiers, who has no earthly way to get out of that trouble. He knows that Peter, that uh, James has already been killed and he's next. What's he going to do? Go to sleep. And this was not a light sleep. This was a deep sleep. Because when you read the context of Acts 12 and the first 11 verses, an angel woke him up and told him to put his shoes on and get ready to go. And he left, went outside, 
And it wasn't until he got outside and fully awake, and the record says this, he came to himself and realized that this was reality. This was not something that he was seeing as a vision. It was actual reality. Now, why in the world was Peter able to sleep under the circumstances in which he was, in which he found himself in jail and going to be executed without question, and yet he was able to sleep? He cast his care upon God. Here was a man who cast his anxiety. He had the confidence of faith to believe that God would take care of him. Suppose he had to die. Well, if he had to die, he had to die. Kind of reminds me of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the Old Testament when they were thrown into the fiery furnace because they wouldn't bow and worship the image. And so they were thrown into the fiery furnace. They weren't worried. Their response to the king was, you know, we don't have to answer you in this matter. We can't. Our God's able to deliver us, but we're not going to tell him to do that. We're going to let him do what his will is. And whatever it is, we're not going to bow before you. We're going to die if need be. You know, if they had died, that would have been a great story. But they didn't because God miraculously saved them. God will take care of his own. We can exercise the confidence of faith. In the book of Colossians chapter 2, it says, For I do not... For I want you to know what a great conflict I had for you and for those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen me in the flesh. For their hearts were encouraged, being knit together in love, according to the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both the Father and of Christ. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul is saying all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in God. Our faith is such that we have trust in God and we're, we're going to serve him and exercise the confidence of faith. And number two, act in accord with your faith. That's what Peter did. He was not a person who was naive. He knew the situation he was in. He knew his life was in jeopardy. He knew that unless something miraculously happened, which he obviously didn't expect because it wasn't until he got outside that he finally came to himself and realized he was not having a vision. He was that sound asleep. And yet, here's a man who acted in accord with his faith. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1, listen to what Paul told the young preacher. When I called remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you, also, therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now listen to this, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Being a Christian does not give us a mind of anxiety. It ought to take away our anxiety. We ought to have a sound mind. And Paul is telling Timothy, I want you to use the gift, the gift that I've given you by the laying on of my hands. They had miraculous powers at that time. And Paul laid his hands on Timothy and imparted a miraculous gift unto him. And he's telling Timothy, don't be timid. Use your gift to preach the gospel, to confirm the gospel by the miraculous powers that I gave you. Because you don't have a spirit of fear. You don't have a spirit of timidity. You don't have a spirit of anxiety. You have a spirit that is one that God gives and one that's pleasing unto him and it's a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Act in accord with your faith. And number three, trust that God's promises are real. Now that's key. How many of us trust that God's promises are really and truly accurate? Now sometimes in this world people make promises that they may intend to keep but something happens that will not allow that to go forward. We all know and experience things like that, and we all may make promises ourselves that we intend to keep, but something happens that puts a roadblock in the way that prevents us from doing what we say we're going to do. That's not true of God. Whatever God promises, God fulfills. God has never reneged on a promise he's ever made, and that's always true through the Old or New Testament. God is faithful. God cannot lie. Now, sorry, I'm sorry to say we all able to lie, and a lot of people do, but that's not what God is, and that's not what God does. Trust his promises are real. In Hebrews chapter 10, listen to what the Hebrew writer said, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Do you catch that? Full assurance of faith that God is going to fulfill what he said he would do. 
He says, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So we have the assurance that we can have God's promises in our lives to be fulfilled. God's not a man that makes a promise that he may or may not be able to fulfill. When God makes a promise, you can take it to the bank, as the expression goes, because it will be fulfilled. So we need to cast our anxiety on God. We need to go to God in prayer, lay our anxieties before him, and leave them with God. And when I say leave them, we need to exercise our faith. We need to demonstrate our faith. We need to show that we believe what God promises. By not worrying and wringing our hands and saying, what are we going to do now? But let God take over. Now, that brings me to the final thought of our study. How does God sustain us? How does God take care of us? He promised that he will. How does he do that? Three ways in the lesson of the years. Number one, sometimes he bears the difficulty for us. Sometimes God will bear the difficulty that we take before him. When you think about that, you think about what the record says in Isaiah 53, in verse 6. It says, and like sheep, we have all gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. Now listen to it. And the Lord, that is Jehovah, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We all have the problem of sin. We all have the problem and burden of sin, and we can wring our hands and, and worry what are we going to do about our sins because we can't do anything to save ourselves. No, but God can, and God has done something. He sent his Son, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3 and verse 16. Now, it's a shame that some people in the denominational world will drive a tent peg on that verse and camp as though that's all the Bible has to say on the subject. But you read John 3 in its entirety, and you'll find that earlier in that chapter, Jesus told Nicodemus, except a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3, 16 does teach that we must have faith, but it's not faith alone. It's an obedient faith. It's a trusting, obedient faith. So those who trust in God, who are willing to obey the gospel and be baptized to wash away their sins, as Saul of Tarsus was told in Acts twenty two sixteen, Why tarest thou arise and be baptized and wash away their sins? We're told by some that Saul was saved on the Damascus road. Well, if that were true, he's the most miserable saved man you'll ever read about because he went into Damascus and for three days he was fasting and wouldn't eat and drink and he was there praying and he was a miserable saved man if that were the case. That that's not the case. Because Ananias, the preacher, went to him and said in verse 16 of, of, of Matthew 22, Why tarest thou? What are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. If he were saved on that Damascus road, why did he not know about it? Why did Luke not know about it who wrote the book of Acts? Why did the Holy Spirit not know about it who guided Luke to write the book of Acts? It's because it wasn't true. It's because he needed to be baptized to wash away his sins. And that's just too plain to misunderstand. Sometimes the Lord will bear our iniquities for us. And he did so on the cross. And indicated of that fact is 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. Who himself bare our sins in his own body on that tree that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes we're healed. Aren't you thankful you don't have to die on a cross? I am. I'm thankful I don't have to die on a cross because of my sins. I'm thankful Jesus was willing to do that. You know, the cross is a terrible, terrible price. It's, a, it's ironic that it's, it's both a glorious thing and it's a horrible thing. It shows us the horror of our sins. It shows us how terrible our sins really are and how much we need the love of God and the mercy and grace of God to forgive our sins. Sometimes the Lord will sustain us by bearing our iniquities and other times... He removes the trial. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse, 12, verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So sometimes when we have troubles and trials, they can turn into temptations. They can turn into temptations to put our faith in self, to put our faith in men, to turn away from God, to put our faith in the material rather than the spiritual. We don't have to do that. There's a way of escape. 
Now, it doesn't say that's the easy way altogether. It doesn't tell us that the way of escape is the way that's popular. But there will be a way. We don't have to sin. We don't have to transgress God's law. We don't have to blame others. We can realize we're responsible for our own actions and that God has made a way for us to escape the temptations. He has sustained us by giving us a way of escape. He will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able to bear. God sustains his people that way. And third and finally, and this is not exhaustive, but it is pretty well covering much of what we have as anxiety in life. Sometimes he gives us the strength to bear up under our troubles. When you turn your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and read where Paul had a thorn in the flesh, he asked the Lord three times to take it away. And the Lord said, no, I'm not going to take it away. It's a messenger of Satan. It was, he didn't blame God. He recognized it came from Satan. So many times when people have problems and troubles and anxieties of life, what they want to do is to blame God. Why blame him? He's not responsible. Now God allowed it to happen to keep Paul humble. He said, lest I be exalted above measure. It was given to me the thorn in the flesh. Now when God told him in verse 9, My grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is all that you need. And my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul said, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul said, I'm thankful now that the power of God is upon me in my affliction. I'm not going to worry about it. It's aggravating to me. I wish it could be taken away, but it can't be. And God is going to give me the strength. He's going to give me the spiritual wherewithal to bear up under the problems that I'm having in my life. So, we believe God can and do great things. God is not a man. He can't be like man. He never makes mistakes. He's faithful always to fulfill what he says he will do. And we can trust him to deliver us in life as we go through our various problems and trials and troubles. And he'll deliver us. And he has taken care of the biggest problems we will ever have. The problem of sin and the problem of death. All of us have those two problems that we have to have a solution to. And the only solution available comes from God and that is the solution of Christ dying on the cross, being raised, and the guarantee that we ourselves will be raised, as Paul argues in 1 Corinthians 15. Those who put their trust in God are those who serve him with a good heart. And the Bible says, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Do you love the Lord? Do you love him enough to keep his commandments? If you do, then you'll be baptized if that's your need. For the remission of your sins. If your child of God gone astray, you come back home and set your eyes back on heaven where they belong. Because Jesus says, we don't have to worry. We can cast our anxiety on God. What a beautiful thought to think of that. In John chapter 14, when Jesus was preparing the apostles for his coming death, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If you were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that there you may be also. That's the promise we have from the Lord, and what a beautiful promise it is, and what faith we need to have in that promise, and to serve him first and foremost, above all the anxieties and all the problems and trials that we may encounter, we can always put our faith in God, and carry our troubles to him, and go to sleep at night like the Apostle Peter did under the severe trial he faced. Are you willing to come to the Lord and obey his will? While together we stand and sing, we invite you to come.